Welcome. This is the Life Habits podcast series, and my name is Carl Vradenberg. This is episode two in the series, and the topic for this installment is time management. We'll try in this session to go through a number of topics that can uh, help you learn new habits to optimize your life and stay sane in a crazy world, which is the overall theme for this podcast series. So let's get into time management. I really like the uh, quote from Thomas Edison that really, I think, hits the nail on the head with regard to the importance of this topic. He says, time is really the only capital that any human being has and the only thing can't afford to lose. The whole point is you can earn money, lose money, but time is only something that if we don't use it and use it wisely, it's gone and it's gone forever. We talked in the first episode, uh, beyond the introduction to the uh, overall podcast series and the approaches that we'd be taking to these sessions, I also talked about the substantive topic of starting with the end in mind, and I gave a number of suggestions uh, on the ways in which you could develop habits that would ensure that you are working on and focusing on items that you think really are important and that you also know what those things are. So everything from thinking of toward the end of your life, thinking back on your life and seeing what would be how you would want to be remembered and what kinds of things you wouldn't want to be remembered for, down to actually having a good idea at any one time of what is most important to you. So if you've done those exercises that I'd suggested in that episode, you're all set for this one. And if you haven't done that work, you can always do that any time as well. But just want to go through a few topics here that have to do with improving your focus on time management. The overall theme here is to take control and do not be controlled by time. You really have this commodity that Thomas Edison talked about that unless you manage it effectively, you squander it. And you'll find yourself at a point in life where you look back and say, hmm, where did all the time go? And did I actually get done what I really wanted to get done? And uh, did I actually accomplish what I had hoped to accomplish? And to prevent that, you really need to take control. So most of the things that we're going to be talking about in this episode will have to uh, do with the notion of taking control. There really is a concept of having various time scales to think about time. One of them is the lifetime one that we talked about in last episode, and also the notion here of a yearly and a weekly time scale as well. So you want to see, for example, what you want to accomplish in a year from now until the end of the year, as well as you know what you want to get accomplished on a time scale of about a week. Now, lots of people actually do time management And again, from my experiences in mentoring people over the years, they tend to do time management on the basis of a daily time scale, meaning they might actually look that morning at what was on their agenda, what they needed to be doing that day, and try, if if anything, you know, try to optimize things that way. Well, that's usually a little too close in. You obviously can't change uh, many things, that meetings that you've booked or whatever, with all of like a single day to to really have any uh, impact. The thought here is to widen your time scale. So do a weekly view on what you would like to accomplish during that week. Again, with a view to this, the stuff that we talked about earlier about really knowing what what is important to you. And then also have this no- notion of the yearly time scale as well. So if you have that notion, if you're looking at a week, for example, and uh, let's say on a Sunday, and this is generally when I do it, you look at your schedule for the week, and you can then uh, decide to make changes, to make, to optimize, to delete, to uh, eliminate uh, certain types of things in your schedule, to add new ones in. And you can still make those uh, changes typically uh, for the week if you've done it on a, on a Sunday. And that sets you up also appropriately for the week so you don't start the week by going crazy and only seeing the meetings, for example, that are just coming up or events that the kids have that you weren't aware of and that you haven't done appropriate prep for or whatever. So the other thing to do is to prioritize the roles 
that you have to think about you know the various roles you have in life if you're you know if you work then you are an employee if you're a manager you're also the manager of employees if you are a married you have a spouse if you have if you also are a parent you've got kids you also uh, have a, other family members you have brothers and sisters etc and you have various aspects of your life that you then flow through these various roles. And these various roles, again, looking back at what we did last time, we're really talking about sort of the prioritization here of things that are most important to you. If you really have your job as the most important thing in your life and you really want that to be the case, then that is your primary role and you need to be prioritizing things with that in mind. If on the other hand, you really have a more balanced view and a lot of people really have that desire, then you're going to want to make sure that you've covered off an equal treatment of, you know, focus on work, focus on family, focus on even a particular child or whatever because they need special uh, attention. But you've got, if you've got to step back and actually do that level of prioritization before you can actually look at this overall time management, you know, question. So I'd suggest you do that as well. Then think about, this is the notion of that we often spend a lot of our time on urgent, uh, unimportant activities. You know, you're constantly at work as well as at home. There's all kinds of things that are going to pull you into a particular situation. And that's the situation where you're out of control. That's where your calendar or other things in your life are actually forcing you to go do activities that you may or may not think are important. And often they are not important. Often in a work situation, you've got urgent requests or something has become urgent because you haven't necessarily attended to it earlier versus the non-urgent important activities. And often these are the ones that when you looked at that business of what you wanted to be known as looking back on your life, what you, how you want to be remembered, those kinds of factors, those are the ones that are typically non-urgent but important. And they often, if you aren't doing appropriate time management, they're the ones that get dropped. And a typical day, you've got all the urgent, you know, a customer called with regard to this, and there's a problem with an employee here. There's a, another item to do at, at home. You know, there's kids that are coming in and they've got to be driven somewhere because there's some event uh, ha- happening. All of those kinds of events will always take precedence over the non-urgent but important activities that are actually much more important to you, your overall satisfaction, your overall satisfaction with having accomplished particular activities within a week, within a year, within your entire lifetime. So if you really want to optimize for achieving the objectives that you have from an overall longer term perspective, you really need to get this thing in control. And that is to minimize the unimportant but urgent activities and really maximize the non not urgent important. And how do you how do you go about doing that? So these are the overall themes and the kinds of habits we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about some very specifics now that um, you can implement right away and see how they would work. Let me first start talking about some ex- examples of things you can do in the work setting and then talk a little bit about what kinds of ideas you might have at home or in your personal life. In the work setting, a large part of work for many people is influenced by the calendar or the diary or the, the the whole schedule of you have a meeting from this and this time, you have another meeting from this and this time, you have a conference call, you have a telephone call. You have, and what's interesting is that a lot of that is actually dictated by the software that you use to track your calendar. And whether that is a an analog one, you know, a non-software based one, sort of a calendar, day timer sort of thing, or if, or if it's more often the case that it's uh, actually an electronic calendar system, the default setting on those is typically an hour. So if it's typically an hour, you typically schedule an hour, and then you typically fill the hour, whether or not that activity that you're going to be dealing with, the uh, topic that you're going to be talking about is really worth an hour to you. So if you if you book every meeting for an hour, you have this notion that you're kind of surprised at the end of the day when you haven't really accomplished the things that you thought were most important. That's because you're probably you're spending a whole hour on stuff that you shouldn't have been spending an hour on. So the one suggestion is to actually start to look at how long you really should be spending in talking about a particular topic. And in my own experience, I've taken the default from an hour to half an hour. So some of the time it gets rushed, but then you realize that, well, if it's really worth only half an hour to me, well, 
too bad if it gets rushed toward the end. You just uh, start to get better at really getting to the net of an issue because you only thought it was worth half an hour to spend on that particular topic. So it's a way of really forcing yourself to be effective and making sure that you actually spend the time that a particular topic actually is worth. Now, related to that, what's also interesting, and I've, again, had mentors or people that I've looked up to in many ways who have done things very, very well. There's a a guy that I used to be mentored by and I worked with many years ago who had this amazing ability to stay focused in a conversation. And he was my supervisor for a while. And even if I only had five minutes with this particular guy, I got the sense that I had had an hour-long meeting with him. I truly felt satisfied that I got everything that I needed to get done. And that, most importantly, that he entirely engaged with me, listened actively to everything that I was saying, and thoroughly addressed the questions that I had. So this is this whole approach of saying, okay, if you're going to start to restrict the times on your calendar and in your schedule to align it with the amount of time that it should be allotted, then you also have to make sure that, and you can even have meetings as short as 15 minutes or five minutes if you need to. But the point here is that you then need to make sure that you stay engaged, that if somebody's going to meeting, be meeting with you for five minutes, 15 minutes, or half an hour, that you truly do focus and you get at the heart of the issue quickly and then resolve the issue if it needs resolving quickly as well. Now, obviously, certain there's going to be exceptions to this. If there's a you know real problem situation, that may take more time. And that's fine. You have to still be flexible somewhat as well. But it's really a question of what do you start off with? What's your pre-planning for this kind of work? You're basically saying this shouldn't take longer than half an hour. So you try to make it that. If there's exceptions to that every once in a while, like once a week, you might have, you know, a meeting that goes longer than half an hour, let's say, for the ones that are, that are deemed to only require that. That's fine. But if you've had, you know, many meetings during the week that used to be an hour long and, and now we're half an hour long, you've saved yourself a lot of time. And what do you do in the time that you saved? You work on the non-urgent, important things as well. Now, you might also want to structure your your week so that you're having meetings certain during certain days of the week and that you actually schedule the non-urgent important work even if that work doesn't actually involve somebody else you might want to book yourself a meeting with yourself on your calendar if you're calendar based where you basically just focus on, for example, if, if it were some self-improvement that you wanted to do, you wanted to do some reading, you wanted to go take a, an online course, let's say, book that. Book off a, a morning, book off an afternoon, and devote yourself to that. You know, I personally switched over to also working at home two days a week now where I make sure that I, I still do calls during some of the time and I'm, I'm still available for certain very important things, but the non important work doesn't go into that time that I'm scheduling for this uh, not urgent, uh, important uh, work. And, and that's been working really, really well. It's all in setting up the expectations. Now, you might have an environment that doesn't lend itself to that very well, or, you know, a boss that wouldn't work that way, let's say. But uh, I'm not saying that you absolutely go one or, or the other entirely. It's more a matter of saying, well, these are the kinds of approaches that I want to take on these days. These other days I will take uh, whatever meetings are, are scheduled, but it's it's a matter of taking control. So you ha- some part of your day, you actually work that way. Now, we're talking about meetings, but meetings are only part of the uh, story here in terms of, of the approach that we take to running our day. We have meetings, we have telephone calls, we have conference calls, we also have email, and we have instant messaging. So we get into the question of think about how best to deal with information or decisions that need to be made with regard to these different ways of dealing with them. A meeting is typically very time-consuming. A call, that is a phone call, can sometimes be as long or often isn't quite as long as a meeting. And, and of course, you're also not having to go to the meeting and come all the way back. You're not expending the time getting there. Conference calls can sometimes be you know, effective as well rather than traveling somewhere. And then we have email and uh, instant messaging. And those, uh, I think, go in order of the amount of time that they take. A meeting itself, an in-person meeting, it takes the most time, but certain types of things are appropriate to do in a meeting. But a lot of things that you do in a meeting, the typical, oh, let's go meet to talk about that, think whether you really need to have a meeting to do that. Uh, Maybe a quick telephone call will work. 
But if you find that telephone calls with a particular person, let's say, are just going to take a lot longer to deal with, then maybe in certain cases you want to deal with that issue via email if you don't want to do a back and forth, back and forth on it. You might even uh, think of doing it with an instant message where you're just going to deal with the issue very quickly, get it resolved, you got it done. You didn't have a great big long meeting, but you might have had an exchange of a few messages back and forth and got it resolved. The other thing to think about with regard to each of these things is how you want to deal with them. So we already talked about meetings a bunch. And the other one is with regard to phone calls. One of the other good practices, I think, and habits on phone calls is really trying to net out, and this came to the same thing for meetings, actually, to net out what the objectives are. If somebody else has called a meeting that is your that you're being asked to, uh, to go to, or somebody's just called you, unless you really do just want to have a general chat with them, and there's some amount of that that's useful in a work environment to really get to know each other better, or to, you know, the variety of things like that, that may lead you to want to talk more. But if you're really on about trying to be also more efficient in the use of your time, you may want to use the practice of saying off the top uh, something to the effect of, you know, I realize we only have half an hour together, so want to make sure that we have the topics covered that uh, you want to have addressed. So maybe off the top of the call, we can just net out what it is that you'd like to accomplish in this meeting or in this uh, phone call. That often cuts, you know, some of the small talk short and actually gets to the objective of the call or the meeting. And a lot of the time, people haven't thought about <laughs> what the overall objective is. But if you start with that notion of what the objective is and the time frame you have available for it, then you can also get much more effective actually achieving it rather than having spent a whole meeting or a whole call and then still realize that you're just about up to the time that the uh, meetings would be over or the conference call might be over and you realize that you still didn't really get to the net of what it is that the other person wanted anyway. The other thing is from with regard to email, and there's a, a lot of email that most people get now, so it re- rules a large part of our lives. The suggestion here is not to be sitting on email all the time, to, and that is to schedule your time for doing email. And that you also, there are a bunch of capabilities in email systems now for setting up and identifying, for example, the people that are sending you email. And you can actually flag them even with colors to indicate that a blue email coming in is from your immediate boss or there might for it be from, from an important customer. And so that can get your specific focus if you need to be able to, to spend some time on it outside of your scheduled times for dealing, dealing with email. So you might actually just deal with some email on an exception basis, but only from selected people that you've deemed prior are people that can interrupt you when you're doing other work. Other than that, just deal with the email during a particular time of the day. And also try to limit the ways in which you actually deal with the email, limit the kinds of things that, you, that that come in. And you can also train the people that you're dealing with that you only deal with things on a, you know, maybe twice a day basis of looking at email. You might even do a single time during the day as well. And really just try to be efficient at doing it as well. The other one with regard to instant messaging The thought here is that it can actually be quite effective and very, very efficient at resolving particular items that need to be resolved very quickly. You can just get on the system. uh, Rather than talking to somebody on a phone uh, call for a long time and getting into all kinds of other chat, you can be very precise. You know, is this server up? Are we going to have a meeting? You can get a quick answer to the the meeting, uh, to the question rather. But you also, I think, want to be careful that in cases where you really don't want to uh, pursue a long-term discussion with somebody, because some people tend to also suck you into those kinds of chats, you can also get out of those more effectively by saying that uh, you need to just concentrate on the uh, phone call that you're on or whatever to get yourself out of that particular session. But the other very important thing is to set your status. Most of these systems can let other people know what your status is. And when you don't want to be bothered by having chat messages come in, you can set yourself to being away or do not disturb. And that's quite a reasonable way of basically putting out a sign that says, "Uh, right now, I don't want to have chat messages coming through. Some systems also let you optimize that for particular types of people coming through. So you can let certain people through and other people can't. But again, it's all about trying to take control of your time 
And very importantly, think about it before any of this stuff happens. So set it up. So set up that rather than having to explain that, no, no, you're not really available. You're really kind of busy right now when somebody sends you a chat message. Instead, set your OA message for at some time that you're going to be, for example, reading or doing some sorts of other work that's in that uh, category of non-urgent, important time. All the mechanisms and the technologies that we use for communicating are important to think through in the ways in which we might want to improve our time management. Now, let's talk about some things with regard to your personal life or our home and how can you deal with and make yourself more optimal in dealing with time issues there and time management. One of the things that I've been finding really effective, and, and you have to have the personality or the desire to do it this way as well, is to more effectively get into multitasking. And I've been finding, and if you're listening to this and you're listening to this on a on an MP3 player or an, or an iPod, you've probably already discovered this for yourself. And that is that if you put things like what we're listening to today on a portable device that um, you can plug then into your ears, you then have freed yourself from being able to do only one thing at a time. And I find that uh, I get audiobooks rather than I still occasionally get hard copy books, but a lot of the material that I read, I now read by listening. And I also listen to podcasts like this one. So I I follow a number of different podcasts and stay up with my substantive area in terms of at work. I also listen to other podcasts with regard to parenting. There's all kinds of great, great podcasts I listen for and look out for in uh, iTunes and elsewhere. But the real message here with regard to time management is that there's a bunch of activities we do, like driving, like running on the treadmill, like running outside, like doing the dishes, to making dinner, to uh, cleaning up the house. You know, all those kinds of activities don't require your entire brain And unless you're involved in it more socially, you know, and some of the time that's the case, but a lot of the time you'd be doing some of these things on your own. And it's really, really beneficial, I think, to just use your audio channel, meaning your ears in this case, and actually engage yourself in the multitask of, you know, driving, for example, and listening to a book or to a podcast or doing the dishes or whatever and listening to a podcast. I find that it's a wonderful way of both making some of those activities that are actually quite onerous at times much, much more enjoyable uh, because they don't take your entire brain. And so this way you can actually do the physical activity, but yet also at the same time be engaging your brain. And not only just engaging your brain, you can get an awful lot done. You can actually, uh, if you're one of your non-urgent important activities is to learn, I don't know, another language. If it's a uh, notion of learning a new technology or, or just becoming a better parent or just reading more, reading more in your disciplinary area or maybe just for enjoyment. You can do all that stuff. You think that you don't have the time to do it. Yeah, if you did them in the analog ways of of having to, you know, buy a book and sit down and read it, well, there are still times when you'd want to be doing that. But a lot of the time, you don't need to have that as a constraint any longer in actually accomplishing those activities. You can do them while you're doing something else. I think it's my personal experience is that it's a an amazingly good way of accomplishing a number of things by doing more than one thing at a time. The other notion of dealing with time management at home is uh, voicemail and text messaging or just dealing with the telephone. Often people get stuck again, just like at work, but you get urgent, unimportant activities grabbing your attention. If you answer the phone when it rings all the time and you get engaged in whatever conversation goes on, you're not in control. Whoever is calling you is in control. If, on the other hand, you put on some voicemail and you could also even monitor it to see if it's somebody important, or you can change the ring, for example. I've done that on my cell phone to make sure that I actually know who actually is calling and that I might actually want to answer certain types of calls from certain people versus others. I don't then get controlled by the telephone. The other thing that I've found really useful is, and I do this particularly on my my cell phone, and that is text messaging rather than telephone all the time. So I keep in contact, for example, with my kids via text messaging. Now, what's the benefit of that? 
Well, I don't have to do things serially. I can, again, multitask. So if I'm doing some activity at home or I've gotten together with friends for dinner and I want to uh, make sure that I'm, I'm in sync with my kids and my kids have a question or they have something they want to have permission to do or whatever, I don't have to be answering the phone while in, I'm in the restaurant or I don't need to be diverting attention from whatever it is that else that I'm doing, interrupting that by dealing with that particular item. I can deal with it directly with regard to text messaging. I can also just send them a standard. I actually have set up a number. Most phone systems have that. A number of preset messages that you can send as well, like where are you? Let me know where where you're at, what time are you coming home, that kind of thing. I think that's extremely useful to rapidly get you know feedback on you know where they are and the like. So you can stay in sync very, very easily by doing that. I highly recommend going away from just answering the phone, whether it's a cell phone or the home landline phone, if you still have one, and switch over instead to having voicemail control over your um, calls, as well as dealing with text messaging as well. The other notion here is to, quite apart from technology, is to think of other ways of having various activities at home that need to be done that really isn't worth it for you to do yourself. And I guess this somewhat depends on, you know, the kind of money you have available and the like. But one of the other things that you might want to consider if you haven't done so already is to basically subcontract. You would subcontract in a business setting where, you know, certain types of activities are really not worth it for your very expensive staff, let's say, to do. You might want to get some uh, less expensive subcontract staff to be able to do that. Well, why not do that at home? So you'd want to do that for, lots of people do that for cleaning the house, for example. I think that's always a a very good one. But even things where you want to go fix something around the house, if you really enjoy doing it, that's great. Then you might want to go do it. It might be nice and relaxing for you. But in other cases, that isn't the case, that you really don't enjoy doing it. It takes some of your valuable time that often is actually worth more than the time you're going to be spent doing that. And so there's the notion of just getting somebody else to come in and do that as well. So don't always assume that you need to be doing everything. And when we're talking about the topic of you need to be doing everything, well, why not also think about assigning tasks to your kids if you have some. And the notion here is to also start to have them learn the kind of practices that we're talking about here and that they would potentially have contingent work on uh, or that their, let's say their allowance is contingent on them doing certain types of activities. So it might be shoveling a driveway or cutting the grass or putting out the garbage, that kind of thing. It's going to free you up for doing other kinds of activities, likely with them. So if the whole family's off doing all their chores, not just you, let's say, then uh, you're going to be able to get that stuff done more quickly. They're going to get a sense of accomplishment and, and linkage of work to value in terms of money that they're going to be getting. And all of you are going to be able to go through and, and accomplish this, the activities that need to be done more quickly when you do it together. And you can actually be spending more time together doing some of that, you know, important but not urgent activity together as well. Because many people talk about the things that they would wish that they had done more of during their lives. They typically say, I would have loved to have spent more time with my family or with my kids. And a lot of people talk about that, with particular if you have smaller kids and also even teenagers, you want to be able to spend more time with them doing really valuable things together and not necessarily just always uh, passing each other as many, many families tend to do. Now, the other last thought is I've talked a lot about trying to schedule things more closely in to, with less time and, and all the rest of it. I just want to also just leave the final thought that all of this is to make things more efficient But you got to realize there are exceptions to this, and also you want to not over-schedule either, especially at home. You want to have the opportunity for those spontaneous opportunities where, you know, a child might come in and have something they want to show you and they want to say, oh, can we go and just work on this for a while? Or can you you see the work that I've done here and like to get some advice on it? There's all kinds of things that are spontaneous things that happen that really need to be done in that moment. And if you've overly scheduled, especially if you've got kids going here and then you got them going over some other activity and then you got to go pick the other one up at this other location, you do way too much of that, you're still not getting kind of the quality time that you 
desire and they desire of being together and doing things that are more spontaneous. I've given you a bunch of ideas, a bunch of habits that you can consider adopting. And my suggestion would be that for all of these kinds of ideas that I've been going through, grab a couple of them. Just to, you know, maybe one kind of work-related one and maybe one home-related one. And just try it for a few weeks. It typically takes somewhere in the neighborhood of about three weeks to really learn a habit and start to have that habit become really part of you and a regular kind of activity that you don't need to be thinking about and becomes natural. So choose things that make sense to you, that really would be really desirable for you to go and try out for a while, things that um, really sound kind of cool to you to go do. Go try those. Just choose a couple. Go do it for, you know, a month and uh, reflect back and say, well, did that work? Do I want to improve that? Do I want to adopt another one? And if that one worked real well, you can add the next one. Might be, for example, just taking your default schedule of an hour for meetings at work. Just go into the software and change the default setting if you schedule your things yourself, your meetings yourself, or if you have an assistant that does it, just give the instruction to your assistant that you'd like to, by default, make all the meetings, unless otherwise specified, half an hour in length rather than an hour. Try that, and perhaps try to do some multitasking at home. So, those are my thoughts on the topic of time management. Of course, Feel free, as always, to go to the show notes site, which is at lifehabits.podbean.com, and you can provide feedback you know, on the site. You can also suggest other topics that you'd like me to address in this series. And you can also send email to lifehabits at gmail.com if you want to use that method instead. I hope you've enjoyed this session. hope it's been of use to you. And I'd like to wish you all the best till the next time we get together. Bye for now.